When it comes to formulating your management plans, the most successful plans are those in which a clinician is able to successfully link the therapeutic goals to the client goals. Now, when clinicians fail to link the therapeutic goal to the client goals, they run the risk of the treatment plan failing. And when that happens, that's on us. So let's discuss. The Progressive Podiatry Project, here to share knowledge, insights, and information for you to improve your clinical practice, and most importantly, help you help your clients. Welcome back to the Progressive Podiatry Project. As always, my name's Talisha, and today we're going to be discussing the art of therapeutic goal setting. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, we have our therapeutic goals and our client goals. And essentially what can happen is when clinicians fail to successfully link the two and fast track this process, um, what this fast tracking of the process can look like is essentially a clinician dictating a management or therapeutic exercise program to the client as opposed to collaborating with them on the development and the implementation of this. And so what this may look like in the consultation process is essentially a lack of discussion with the client regarding their movement and exercise history or failing to explore their likes and dislikes in relation to movement. And what often happens is if a clinician's approaching the consultation from, well, with this approach, Oftentimes what will happen is the exercise therapies that are issued and prescribed at the end of the consultation, it's often just almost like an afterthought where you have the clinician going, okay, we've done this assessment, we're going to do this treatment, strapping orthoses, and they've taken the scans for orthoses, or we've gone through a footwear script or whatever it is. And then right at the end of the consultation, it's almost like the exercise therapies are an afterthought. Now, if this is the approach that you're taking, I pose this question and just for a little bit of reflection on maybe how you're approaching the exercise prescription process with your clients. So if a clinician is paying little attention to a treatment intervention or fails to communicate the importance of it, so in this example, it's just a really quick, brief, last minute, oh, here's a printed sheet of your exercises just do them at home three by ten because I love ragging on that but it's almost like an afterthought that's just issued in the final few minutes of a treatment consultation and then it's thank you see you later I'll see you at your next appointment so when this is happening how can we expect a client to see the intervention as meaningful or important as part of their recovery or management if this is how we're approaching it as a clinician now, I'm just going to quickly circle back to what I mentioned before as far as therapeutic goals and client goals and just unpack this a little bit more. So essentially, what's the difference between a client's goals and the therapeutic goals? Essentially, if we look at this as when a client comes to see us, they tell us what, we show them how. And so what this is, is the client will come in and they tell us what they want to achieve from seeking our care. So this may be, I want to get back to running. I want to, and they won't say this, this is sort of paraphrasing, but I want to get back to engaging in my activities of daily living independently or whatever it is, getting back to soccer. Now that's their client goal. So that will set the overarching goal of our entire management plan, because that is why they're seeking our help. They're wanting us to help them overcome the problem, which is I can't engage in this activity for xyz reason okay so what the therapeutic goals are is they're the physiological and or psychobehavioral changes we're seeking from our therapeutic treatment interventions and oftentimes i'll be talking about exercise prescription but it's our therapeutic goals again physiological and psychobehavioral changes that we're seeking from our treatment interventions in order to help our client achieve their goals so like I said, the clients are telling us what, we're showing them how. Now, the first step to formulating our therapeutic goal is identifying what we're dealing with. Now, there's a few steps in this process. Now, the first is arriving at a diagnosis, if there is one. So remember, we don't always need a diagnosis. Sometimes the most accurate diagnosis is not 
arriving at a diagnosis at all because not everything is an actual pathology. Simply telling someone that, oh, you've just overdone it, that's all that they need to hear if that's all that's going on. So don't feel that you need to give something a label if there's not actually anything there to label and we're just doing it for the sake of doing it. Now, secondly, once we've got some idea of what we're dealing with, we need to identify the capacity gap that exists. So that is where the client is starting from, where they want to finish, how big is that gap that sits between the, those two metrics? And basically what we look at that is how big is the gap between where they are functionally now at this point in time to how far away are they from functionally being able to achieve their goal? Now, moving on from once we've identified what we're dealing with, it's exploring the why. That is why the problem has developed in the first place. So in this element, we need to have some consideration and explore potential mechanisms of action, the potential causative factors and or underlying risk factors that may present that have allowed the problem to develop in the first place. Now, if we neglect to explore why the problem has developed in the first place, we run the risk of either A, not reaching a successful treatment outcome, or B, we can potentially perpetuate the injury because we haven't actually addressed why the problem's there in the first place. So this will often happen if people are focusing more on, like I've explored in other vlogs, is if we're focusing more on managing a symptom as opposed to improving function. So exploring the why, that will, whilst it may not be something that we will actively implement treatment on on day one, if we are able to gain some understanding of why the problem is there in the first place and we can begin to address that throughout our treatment process, again, it can hopefully lead to better treatment outcomes and reducing the risk of the problem recurring later on down the track. So it creates a more sustainable treatment outcome. And lastly, we come to how, and it's in the how of linking our therapeutic goals to the treatment goals or the client's goals. This is where we get to artfully apply the science. So in order for us to successfully execute this linking, there's a number of elements we need to explore, which are arguably the most important elements that will set us up for treatment success. And these elements are addressing education, goal setting, and then lastly, application of load. So when we're referring to education, what we want to think about and consider is what knowledge gaps exist that are potential barriers for our client to proactively engage in their management plan. There may be a number of knowledge gaps that exist for that particular individual that will, again, potentially create barriers for them to proactively engage in their therapeutic management which will also translate to their level of self-efficacy. So some of these elements, it may be their level of health literacy. It may be just their understanding of the pathology itself, um, the reasons why the pathology or the problem has developed in the first place. The, their sort of barriers to self-efficacy, their exercise and health behaviours, all of those things. So the more we get to know a client, the more we're able to, again, identify these potential knowledge gaps, and the more we can fill in and address these gaps, again, it will create longer term, more sustainable therapeutic outcomes, because the more we can build self-efficacy and understanding, the more a person is able to proactively engage in the treatments that we're recommending. Next up is goal setting. Now these can be broken down into our macro and micro goals. So the macro goal is that's our overarching treatment goal. So essentially the client's goal, why they're seeking our help in the first place, and then our overarching therapeutic goals of what we need to do as a clinician to help them achieve that goal. And then breaking that down is they're the smallest steps that we need to identify and address to help inch them towards their overall macro goal. So this will, so for some people, a micro goal may be just the things that we set up in between consultations. So hopefully by the next consultation, you might be able to do 
X number of minutes of this specific exercise, or hopefully we can get you running to five kilometers, or I want you to download this fitness app. But essentially, like I said, the micro goals are all the small steps in between consultations that we work towards to slowly chip away and work towards the overarching macro goals. And lastly is the application of load. So as clinicians, when we're managing musculoskeletal pathologies, we're often required to facilitate the body's healing via mechanotherapy from the application of load. Now, this is quite a broad stroke that we're applying because in some instances, it may just be some exercises to guide reintroduction of movement. So kind of education regarding say load management. In other instances, it may be a much more fine tuning of our therapeutic exercise prescription. So we may be prescribing certain exercises to achieve or trigger specific adaptations within tissue. So it may be um, improving the energy storage release capacity of the Achilles tendons for, for someone that's got, say, mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. So it may be quite targeted exercise therapy. So initially it may be... Um, isometrics progressing into eccentrics progressing into plyometrics progressing into or complemented with load reintroduction as far as running goes so like i said it can be quite a broad stroke but the application of load when we're managing musculoskeletal pathologies is often the last piece of these three bits of the puzzle that will help us get the client to their therapeutic and well meet their therapeutic goals so we can help them achieve their goals so now we have a bit more of an understanding of the various elements that we as clinicians should be considering when it comes into formulating and fine tuning our therapeutic goal. Now we want to link those therapeutic goals to our client's goals. So there's typically five stages that exist in the development of a rehabilitation management plan. So during each stage, there's crucial elements we must explore if we want to gather the relevant information to formulate an individualized and hopefully meaningful and very hopefully a successful management plan. So the five steps is the consultation, formulation, education, initiation, and then lastly, implementation. So the first step is this is the consultation. And when I'm referring to the consultation, in this situation, I'm referring more so to the subjective information gathering part of our appointment. So when we're consulting, when we're interacting, when we're engaging with the client. So the information that we gather here is highly relevant and essential for us to formulate our rehabilitation programs that are going to be meaningful to the individual. So during the subjective information gathering process and that conversation that we're having with the person it's so important to focus on building rapport understanding and identifying the client's goals and also as a subset to this is gaining an understanding of their expectations so what are they expecting to achieve or get out of having a consultation with you and other elements that we need to explore that are very important is say their or all their relevant histories. So have they had this injury before? What's their level of health literacy like? Um, what previous treatments may they have had? What were those experiences like? What worked for them? What didn't work for them? All of this information is very relevant and it can also help us identify potential barriers that may exist for that individual that may impede their ability to adhere to a management plan we develop. And then Lastly, it's not lastly, but the last thing that I'll mention as part of this is, again, arriving at a diagnosis if there is one. Next up is the formulation process. So this is where we're beginning to link the client's goals with our therapeutic goals. So by this stage, we would have we've done our subjective history gathering and we've probably done a fair bit of objective assessments and or functional assessments. And basically, like I mentioned before, is the therapeutic goals are the physiological and psychobehavioral changes that we're seeking from our therapeutic exercise prescription or intervention in order to facilitate the client achieving their goals. So we've gathered a range of subjective information that's relevant to the individual. And we've also gathered a fair amount of objective information. And this is where we'll then combine that all and begin to put it into practice. 
So what we need to consider for this element with the formulation step is basically the type of injury, the mechanism or mechanisms of injury, the stage of healing that the injury is in, any psychobehavioral barriers, the, as I've mentioned, the person's movement and health literacy, then we'll begin to start to consider what exercises or we'll begin to select some exercises that we may feel are appropriate pertaining to the client's goals, the therapeutic goals that we've identified, their specific injury, the stage of healing it's in, the exercise selection. At this stage, it's a bit of a tentative selection, and I'll explain more why in a minute. Um, and then we begin to formulate our proposed therapeutic exercise dosage. And we also need to consider the equipment and the environment that the person will be conducting the exercises in. So as I mentioned, I will be jumping back and reviewing a little bit of that tentative exercise selection in the next step. But now we come to education. So at this point, we've gathered a lot of information and we've been Begun to formulate our management plan, factoring in the client's goals, our therapeutic goals, and the education step. This is where we're able to begin to cultivate that meaning for the person. And essentially, this is where we get our clients buy-in for our management plan. So when we do this, we really need to enforce the what, why, when, and hows. So with this, this is what exercises will they be doing? Why are they performing these specific movements? Now, this is a crucial piece of information that we need to convey because if we're missing this piece of the puzzle, this is where we can be missing cultivating that sense of meaning for the individual. So, and again, this is why there's a big difference between therapeutic goals and client goals because if we tell a client that you're getting this exercise because we want to improve the type 1 collagen remodeling and increase the cross links that exist within the tissue to increase the stiffness for energy storage and release capacity, blah, 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 word salad that means nothing to them. That it doesn't mean anything to them. It sounds fancy, but so we as clinicians need to have that understanding because I feel that if we're prescribing any treatment, not just exercise therapies, we need to have an understanding of what this intervention is going to do to the individual's musculoskeletal tissue or their body what effect it's going to have because we need to have an understanding because that's just our job it's the same as if a pharmacist is dispensing a drug or a doctor is writing a prescription for a drug they need to know what that medication is going to do physiologically to the individual because that's their responsibility because they're issuing that same with exercise therapies but anyway so that's the therapeutic side of it but the client's goals so instead of us going word salad blah 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 tendon stiffness it may be we're giving you these exercises because it may make the tendon stronger so it won't get aggravated when you try and run your 5k park runs on the weekend so the why that's always so important for any stage of the treatment process but essentially very important here Okay, and then the next part is the when and the how. So when will they be performing the exercises? This formulates part of our dosage. So will they be performing the exercises every day, alternate days, once a week? It's just answering that question. So it formulates part of our dosage. And then how will they be performing the exercises? Now this comes back from, and what formulates this a bit is by exploring the person's movement and exercise history, what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy. So for example, some people don't enjoy going to a gym. They would prefer to do their exercises at home. So how will they be performing the exercises? For this individual, it may be with at-home equipment in their lounge room. For someone else who prefers a gym setting because they go there, they know for that half an hour they're just going to be doing those exercises, that's how they factor it into their day. Other people prefer to be guided with their exercises. So are we referring them to a group class that we run? Are we referring them to a gym class that they're already doing? Are they already under an exercise physiologist? Are we, con are we conversing with the health practitioner or the fitness professional that's supervising that to integrate the rehabilitation into that setting? So the how is 
how we tailor the exercises to what the person's preferences are, because this has a really big impact on their potential level of engagement. So again, with the education, we always need to make sure that we hammer into and cover off the what, why, when, and how, and package that up and make sure that the client understands that's why we're doing what we're doing. Now, moving on from education, we come to the initiation. And oftentimes, even though this is stepped out separately, oftentimes the initiation and education phase will be happening concurrently, especially in relation to the how, as this is where we'll be demonstrating the exercises and having the client engage in the movements that we're prescribing. So, and again, this is why what I referred to earlier when we've got our tentative exercise prescription, because we may be going after we've done our history taking our objective assessments go, okay, we know for, I know for this particular musculoskeletal injury that, and in order to achieve the client's goals, we need to be looking at a calf raise exercise, whatever the exercise is. But then when we're implementing the program, or not implementing, sorry, initiating the program, um, so this is where we're starting to formulate, we may get the client to try and do a calf raise and they can't do it. It's They either don't have the strength or it's aggravating or whatever. So then this is where we're going to tinker with the exercise. We may need to regress the exercise. So instead of them being able to do a unilateral calf raise, which is what we were thinking, it may have to regress back to a bilateral calf raise. Can they do that? Um, if that's too easy, then it may be a tandem calf raise. So this is where we start to play around and we fine tune our, our exercise selection, right? So, um, like I said, there's it's for us to fine tune, but the purpose of the initiation phase is also to help foster the client's understanding of why we're implementing specific movements or specific exercises of their program. And it's also ensuring that they have the knowledge and the skills and the understanding of how to do these movements correctly and safely. So another thing that how you can look at the initiation phase of your program implementation, it's essentially the fine tuning and the troubleshooting phase. So are there any knowledge gaps that may still remain from when we've communicated with the client throughout this process? Are there any issues as far as understanding specific movements and doing the movements? So this is how we fine tune everything. So we're going from having our client goals, identifying the therapeutic goals to our tentative exercise prescription. Now we're putting all that together and um, the next and final step is when we're implementing. So we've gone through, we've identified the client goals, we've identified our therapeutic goals, we've gone through and troubleshot, figured out where they're starting from, what exercises they can do safely and effectively and are going to load the tissues correctly. And then the next step is the implementation. Now, just before we get into the implementation, there's a couple of questions that you need to ask yourself. So the first one is, have I had open communication with the client? Have they asked questions? Have I answered those questions? Do they understand the whys of their program? Why we're doing this exercise, what this is going to achieve? And the other part, which is also quite important, is does or will the client have access to the required equipment and resources in order for them to engage in the exercise rehabilitation program when they leave the clinic? Okay, so you've answered all of those questions with a yes, 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 and yes. I've cultivated the why. It seems like we've got a lot of meaning or intrinsic meaning generated from the client. We're all on the same page with what the goals are, what we're looking to achieve, all of that. So now we're implementing the program. This is right at the end when we're wrapping up the consultation. So this is what they're going to be doing with their management plan in between right now and then when you review them next. So in order for us to have confidence that the client's likely going to engage in the management plan throughout the time in between consultations, hopefully we've been able to reflect on and feel quite comfortable that we've been able to foster sufficient levels of intrinsic motivation for the client to buy in and want to be part of their rehabilitation and recovery program. And then we've also made sure that 
we've either, well, have created an environment, but the client also has access to an environment that's going to allow them to engage in our management plans. And then lastly, we always want to follow up. So for some people, this may just be, we'll follow up at the next consultation if we're confident that they're going to be able to stick to the plan in between consults. Other times we may need to follow up just via a phone call at regular intervals in between consults. This is something that I'll do quite regularly. If you have someone that, if, for example, if you need to sort of repeat certain movements or they just didn't seem to have that high level of self, oh, not self, well, self-efficacy comes into it, but it may be if they, um, just their body awareness and their movement literacy that's what I was after. If they seem to struggle a little bit with certain elements of the program, you may want to follow up with them a little bit more regularly in between consultations, because that's one thing that um, will often fuel people dropping off. If they have, say, their exercise prescription or whatever the management plan is in between consultations, and then something happens and they don't do it. This is where you'll often see someone cancel their appointment because They might call up and go, I haven't done my exercises because of X, Y, Z. No, I'll just call back later on once I've done them and they don't say re-engage. But once I've started doing my exercises again, then I'll call up and make a follow-up appointment. Oftentimes, they'll just drop off. You might not see them again or for months. So if you have someone that, well, one, if they cancel, but even to try and head off them potentially cancelling and falling off the rails identify if you have someone that you're a little bit there's a flag going off going okay they may not stick to what the plan is in between for whatever reason I'll often let them know oh well just to see how you're going I might give you a call in a couple of days just to make sure everything's okay and yeah for those people if it's say a two-week review I might call them three or four times I'll let them know that I'm going to do that but yeah flag that but essentially we want to just make sure both of us have the conflict confidence at the end of the consultation that they're going to be able to engage in and adhere to the collaborative management plan that we've created. So hopefully this has given you a little bit more insight into the importance of identifying our therapeutic goals and our client goals and also the importance of being able to link the two together and given you some insights in how we do that. Now, if you're a health practitioner who wants a free resource to help guide you through the exercise prescription thought process, I encourage you to download our movement prescription blueprint that you can get from progressivepodiatryproject.com forward slash blueprint. And that's it for today. It's been great. I'll see you next time. Cheers. 